Well, I think that the meeting has served to galvanize so many different groups around two things. One is the realization that from a scientific standpoint that we clearly have the tools in the form of treatment and prevention which under optimum conditions if you implement them optimally like in a clinical trial there's clear proof that they work. Things like treatment itself unquestionably is a life-saving modality. Uh, prevention modalities when properly adhered to work like treatment and pre as prevention, circumcision, mother-to-child transmission, pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, topical microbicides, all under the proper conditions. When you take those that show that they biologically work, we learn some lessons that when you try and bring them into the field to see if being effective, uh, being efficacious in a clinical trial really means being effective in the community, we realize that we still have many challenges. But the one thing that we all agree upon, that even without a vaccine and even without a cure, we still have enough tools that we can have a substantial positive impact on the trajectory of this pandemic so that you can bring down new infections, you can get people under therapy, you could decrease, if not eliminate, mother-to-child transmission. That's the good news. The other message is that this is not going to happen spontaneously and it's not going to happen automatically. It's going to be very complicated and it has to be a global commitment at the political, organizational, country, and individual level to make it happen. So bottom line message is the tools are here. We know that. Years ago, we weren't sure they worked. We know now that they can work. And the mandate for the next several years is to implement them in a way that you can turn around the pandemic. To me and to others, that's really the message of the meeting. A lot of good things, but enormous challenges. There is a lot of discussion about funding. You have uh, donor countries, the rich countries, and then uh, the recipient countries. What is the political uh, balance between accountability in those countries affected and the donor countries as you see it? I think we need to think less about donor and recipient and look at more what we're seeing right now is partnerships and countries beginning to take ownership of their own problem. There are some countries that have such dire health infrastructures and dire economic situations that they can't do that themselves. And they do need partnership with or help from the developed world. But the only way this is gonna work in the long run is if gradually more and more countries take on their own responsibility and we're seeing real successes in many countries where the Africans, for example, themselves are solving their problems. We're seeing that in Rwanda with very, very uh, good leadership and important strides in the right direction. In Botswana, we're seeing that in South Africa. A few years ago, South Africa was a big problem. There wasn't the political leadership. There wasn't the resources put into prevention and treatment. Right now, it's been extraordinary, the transformation in South Africa. So it really is less of a donor recipient than it is more getting the process to involve much more intensively the countries. Obviously, resources are needed. And in times of fiscal constraints, resources become an issue. However, balanced against that, this uh, constraints of resources is the fact that with efficiencies, we've actually done much better. In other words, things that cost a lot of money years ago are done much more, less expensively now. The cost of the drugs have come way down. Procedures like circumcision that had to be performed by physicians and then by nurses and now by healthcare workers who are not as expensive 
as having a physician do it, if they're well trained enough. Community groups going out and involving people and bringing them in for testing and linking them to care. So there's a lot of efficiencies, number one. Many countries are starting to assume responsibility for their own problems. And we need to get more donor countries involved. I mean, for example, the United States clearly with PEPFAR has transformed the entire landscape with PEPFAR. They have had enormous success. PEPFAR is, has funding that is now being joined in a way to be synergistic with the global fund for the purpose of getting more resources into the global fund so that we can leverage that to get other countries who have not contributed traditionally to the global fund to start contributing, like Saudi Arabia, like Germany, like Japan, like other countries. Can the United States, with its uh, experience uh, as a strong power in HIV AIDS response, influence these countries? Well, we, we try to influence them by example. I mean, to show what we've done with the Global Fund and our contribution and the spectacular success of the PEPFAR program. Uh, everyone likes success and no one likes failure. So if we want to give as an example, look at the success of PEPFAR. So other countries that don't have the resources to have their individual PEPFAR can contribute to the global fund and know that both of those things are going to synergize to get the resources available to do the kind of infrastructure building. So before it was an emergency plan. Now the emergency becomes a sustainable health system, sustainable health care that you can then integrate this into what occurs naturally in a country. What is happening in the HIV AIDS research right now that you expect a lot from? Well, what we're, what, what we're pushing for is we need, for example, still need additional drugs in the pipeline that would be able to replace drugs when resistance arrives. We need drugs that are long acting to help get around the issue of adherence, both in people who are infected and being treated versus those who are in a pre-exposure prophylaxis situation to have more long-acting drugs. We know that there's a tremendous relationship between biological effect and behavioral effect in prevention of HIV. So although conceptually topical microbicides work under the best of conditions, one of the approaches that's being taken is a ring that's uh, embedded with antivirals so that a person only need, the woman needs to put in the vaginal and cervical ring once a month as opposed to taking uh, topical microbicides with intercourse or every day. The other is vaccine work. We're, ha we're making progress in vaccine work. It's still an enormous challenge. We look to see that in the years to come we will be able to make advances in the area of vaccine. And then there's the issue of a cure. And I think one of the things we have to be careful that people don't confuse a cure with the epidemiological phenomenon of ending the pandemic. A cure is still very, very early on in the discovery phase and cannot be implemented practically for who knows how long because we don't have the cure tools yet to implement them. And I think that's one of the things we want to make sure that people don't confuse ending an epidemiological phenomenon like a pandemic with curing people who are already infected. There is a big difference there. Uh, you have been involved in the AIDS advocacy as a leader uh, for more than 25 years in the HIV AIDS response. How important is it to understand and document the history? Well, I think we know well beyond HIV how history is so important. Uh, people who don't look at history are doomed to repeat mistakes. Uh, so we need to look at what has happened, how we respond, what worked, what didn't work, and not forget uh, how things were back 31 years ago in the beginning how they've evolved scientifically, how they've evolved from a public health standpoint. So I think as in 
wars, as in development of new nations, history itself is critically important. What is driving you still after being involved since the start? Well, what drives me is the fact that we still have an enormous global problem. And as a physician and a scientist who's devoted my entire life to the uh, addressing of the problems of disease, infectious diseases, which is what I do, that what drives me is the continued suffering and death that is resulting from HIV globally. And that's my life's work, to stop that, to stop it with prevention and to stop it with treatment. And that's what we're going to continue to do until we have the HIV pandemic behind us and not still a challenge in front of us. And that will happen in your lifetime? I believe so. I believe so. Um, hopefully I will live that long, but I believe it will. <laughs>